Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Faith Chapel. My name is Jordan. If we haven't yet had the chance to meet, and if you're joining online, there's a host available ready to answer any questions you might have as you go and just be there to serve you and get to know you. Well, I have been married to my wife for just about eight and a half years now, and I've got two boys. My oldest is Harvey, who's six, and he's going to kindergarten in just about a week, which just is kind of blowing my mind a little bit. Um, And then our youngest is two, and his name is Cohen. I spoke last April, and if you uh, heard me speak then, you would have heard me lovingly and affectionately refer to him as our little raccoon. And just as an update, he still is a raccoon. He's crazy. He gets into everything that hasn't changed. For the last couple of weeks, my family, I don't know about you guys, but we, uh, we're kind of an Olympics family. My wife especially is a huge fan, so she talked me into buying one of the streaming packages so we could get every single clip in sport, which there's, I, did anybody know that there's something called bouldering that you can win a, a gold medal? I had, had no idea, but you can win a gold medal for climbing a rock. And if you do that, there's, there's, that's great. I just don't understand it. I don't know how you win bouldering. Like, how do you win that? Uh, but apparently you can do that. Um, so we, we, we bought this streaming package and last week I was out of town and Alyssa told me that part of their going to bed routine for Harvey, our oldest, was to watch a little bit of TV to kind of wind down before bed. And one of the nights he just goes, mom, please, do we have to watch Olympics again? And she's like, yes, this is every, this is only every couple of years. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to take it in. And uh, the, right after we'd purchased that streaming package, I sat down, it was an afternoon and I was like, you know, I'm going to see what's, what's on. I should have access to everything. Right. And I sit down and there was nothing. There were no sports live. There was no coverage. I was like, seriously, how does this work? But what was happening is they were doing an interview with a guy named Michael Phelps. And Michael Phelps, for those of you who don't know, is one of the most winningest Olympians the U.S. and maybe even the world has ever seen. He's got world records, Olympic records in swimming. The guy is just an athletic animal. He just crushes, right? And so they're interviewing because this is the first, I think he's been competing since 2000. He did like, I think five Olympiads in a row. And so this is his first summer Olympics that he wasn't competing. So they're interviewing him to see what he's interested, who is he watching? What is he excited about? And it reminded me as as I saw this, it reminded me of something else that they did with Michael Phelps a few years ago. And they followed him around because he was just at the peak of his performance. And so they, they asked the question, what does Michael Phelps eat? And so they followed him around for a couple of days and they're documenting all the food that this guy puts away. And it turned out that Michael Phelps in a day eats somewhere around 10,000 calories. At the peak of his performance, he was putting away 10,000 calories, which if you know, that's five times what the average person is recommended to eat. We're supposed to, they say, eat around 2,000 calories a day. So they're, they're documenting all this stuff and it comes out to be like stacks of pancakes, not like two or three. We're talking like an entire stack or two of pancakes and an entire pizza for lunch and protein on protein on protein. The guy is just putting away food. And as I was thinking about this, I realized that the only reason he can do that is because he is an an Olympian. He's an Olympic athlete at the peak of his performance. And so what I want to talk about a little bit today is this idea that our identity should drive our consumption. Our identity should drive our consumption. And the reason for that is because there's kind of this loop that I want you to picture, like a circle. And if I had planned farther in advance, I would have had like a whiteboard or, you know, a cool graphic on the TV, but, you know, it just hit me now that I could do that. So just picture it in your, <laughs> picture it in your mind's eye, this circle at the top is identity. And then in a circle is, is at the bottom is consumption and identity should drive our consumption. But the inverse is also true that sometimes our consumption can alter our identity. And we're going to look at this passage at the end of Matthew chapter three, that's about Jesus getting baptized. And we have this beautiful identity statement from God to Jesus. But I'm gonna set the scene before we get there. So it's Matthew three, and we have a guy named John the Baptist. And he's, he's been preparing the way for Jesus. He's been having his own ministry and he's got a group of followers and these people that he's been communicating to. 
And so John's on the bank of the Jordan River. He's baptizing people and he's saying this phrase, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And he's trying to get his followers and the people near him to understand that there's somebody coming. And this person is called the Messiah or the Savior. And this person that's going to come, this person's going to be great. This person's going to be a hero. This person is going to rescue us. He's going to make wrong things right. He's going to restore Israel to its former glory. You see, at this point in history, the Jewish people were under the oppression of the Roman government. And the Roman government had set up kind of puppet governments, kings and governors all over the place just to kind of appease and keep the Jewish people a little bit at bay. But they knew that this is not how it's supposed to be. And so they were anticipating and waiting for this person, this Messiah to come and save them, to make all things right again. And in their their minds, they're even hoping that this person that comes is gonna come with power, is gonna come with authority and hopefully overthrow this political oppression. And so John has been communicating this his entire life. He's communicating somebody's coming, this Messiah, he's on the way. And he even says right before, right before we get to this part that we're gonna study for a moment, he's gonna say, I'm not even worthy to untie this guy's sandals. That's how great he is. So Jesus arrives on the scene. And John and Jesus have a conversation. It's almost a little bit of an argument. And we, it happens really fast. If you've read this portion of scripture, it's, it's pretty quick. But there's a lot of subtext happening. And, and so John and Jesus interact and Jesus comes down to the river and he says, hey, John, I, I wanna be baptized as well. And in John's mind, he's thinking, hold on, that's backwards. You're supposed to be the guy. You're supposed to be the Messiah. You're the one with the authority. You're the leader. You're supposed to baptize me. And I imagine in John's mind, in this moment, he's actually disappointed. That the first time he interacts with Jesus, he's going, really? This is the one we've been waiting for? And he's asking me to baptize him? That's, he's supposed to be greater than me, not the guy that I baptize. And the watching audience is probably feeling and and sensing a similar thing that really, this is the guy that is supposed to be our savior, our Messiah. And then we pick up in Matthew chapter three, verses 16 and 17. And it says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. So we've got this seemingly audible voice communicating both to Jesus and to John and to all those who were gathered that day saying this phrase, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. And so I want to break down that phrase a little bit. First is, this is my son. And that's, that's a status statement. It's an existential statement. It's unchangeable. It, it, you can't not be somebody's son after a while. In fact, I was going on a drive with my, with my oldest, Harvey, and he likes to ask weird questions. He's very inquisitive. So as we're driving, we're going to, to visit my parents and we're driving down the street and it gets just a little bit quiet and he, he kind of pauses and he goes, hey dad, is grandpa still your dad? I was like, yeah, yeah, grandpa is still my dad. He goes, okay. Pauses for a second and then he goes, when I get old like you, will, will you still be my dad? I was like, yes, absolutely, I'll still be your dad. I will never stop being your dad, right? Would you have a, we all have fathers or mothers or we got here somehow, right? And the status is not gonna change. And so God is communicating in this moment, this is my son. This is a core identity statement about who he is. And God is also confirming because as everyone is doubting, as everybody is feeling this sense of disappointment in Jesus' beginning of his earthly ministry, God's also confirming something. This is, is the one I chose. I didn't make a mistake. And so even though the beginning feels quiet and small, God is saying, yep, this is the guy. This is the one. 
And one of the things that I think is valuable for this is, is when, we, when we start to question who we are, it comes back to our identity, right? And so one of the things I'm working on with my, with my boys is I try and communicate as clearly as I can that th- them being my son carries value. And so I'll sit down and Harvey gets so annoyed of me when I do it. I, I did it a lot when he was about three or four and, and I would sit down on the couch and I'd have him look me in the eyes and his eyes would kind of dart back and forth because he didn't want to look at me in the eyes and be like, hey, Harvey, I'm proud of you. And why am I proud, proud of you? Oh, because I'm your son. Can I go now? Yes, you can go. And God is looking at Jesus in this moment and saying, this is my son. And then he says, whom I love. Which he's reminding that just because he's his son, he is loved. It's an extension of his sonship. And I don't know about you, but I can question. I can question if I'm lovable. I can question even my relationship with God. In fact, there was a period of time where I had a very obligatory relationship with God where I knew he liked, or excuse me, I knew he loved me, but I didn't believe that he liked me. And I felt like, yeah, you have to love me. That's who you are, you're God, you have to love me. But I'm not confident that you like me. And in this moment, what God is communicating to Jesus is not just a status statement, not just, yep, you're my son, but he's also affirming and confirming the extension of that. You are loved in this moment. Because later on, in the story, actually right after this, Jesus is gonna go out into the desert and the enemy is gonna throw questions at him that come in direct contradiction to this phrase. And so in this moment, Jesus is filling himself with the voice of God to both confirm and affirm his identity and that he is loved. He's loved right now. And, And this is a picture of God's posture toward us that it's not just obligatory, that we are sons, we are daughters of God if we are in Jesus and we are, we are loved right now. And then the final part of that statement is, with him I am well pleased, which is probably my favorite because I tend to be performance driven. I'm kind of a perfectionist. I love my to-do lists and days off are difficult to me because if I'm not doing something valuable, it kind of messes with my mind a little bit. But God looks at Jesus in this moment And he finishes this phrase by saying, with you, I am well pleased. And what's so significant about this phrase is Jesus hasn't done anything yet. This is before his earthly ministry. So he hasn't performed any miracles. He hasn't healed anybody. He hasn't gone to the cross. He hasn't been raised from the dead. Nothing remarkable in Jesus' life has taken place. In fact, we're at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, which means we're only in chapter three. There's not much to document before that. Yet, God looks at his son and says, I'm already pleased with you before you've even lifted a finger. And so this communicates to us today that our identity and who we are isn't rooted in performance. It's not about what we do. So this statement for us today can reframe how we define identity. This reframes how we define identity because we can go to the statement whenever we question, whenever we find ourselves wondering, we can ask the question, who am I? I am a son or a daughter of God. I am loved and I am not what I do. That's the weight of this statement, of this phrase that God communicates. And so I wanna break this down into a few different points to help us take this and, 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 and carry it into our lives. Point number one is this. This is an anchor. This is an anchor if we'll consume it. And here's what I, what I mean by consume. When I say the word consume, I mean, what are you filling yourself with? We see Jesus filling himself with the voice of God as he comes up out of the water. So, so we're looking at this word consume as something that you're listening to, you're filling yourself, you're hearing. And, and what I'm not communicating when I say the word consume is something maybe some of you might be familiar with called consumer Christianity. And if you're familiar with that, what it means is 
something, it's, it's, a, it's a posture towards the church where you flip the mission of the church upside down and you make it about filling your own needs, your own desires, and you're just coming to take, take, take. And that's unhealthy. And I'm not, I'm not using consume in that context. And I just wanna clarify that. So this is an anchor if we'll consume it because things will challenge this. Life will challenge this core identity statement. For me, even just a couple of weeks ago, I was, I was dealing with some obstacles and trying to problem solve some things and I was really feeling frustrated and confused. And so I'm an external processor, which means I have to talk out loud or I have to type it out or I have to write with a pen and paper just to kind of get my thoughts in order. And so I sat down one evening and I'm, I'm just writing things out and trying to figure out what's going on. And as I'm, as I'm journaling, I realized that I was looking to the people in my sphere of influence to communicate some core things to me. I was looking for people around me to affirm, Jordan, you're a good dad, you're a good husband, you're a good leader, you're doing all right. And I realized in that moment that I was looking to the people around me to do something they really couldn't do because God had already communicated it to me. I was asking the people in my sphere to fill a need that they couldn't fill. I was seeking affirmation. And if, if I was Jesus in this moment, or if I had a moment like this, where God spoke such a powerful statement out loud, I'd write that down. I would write it down. I'd put it on my mirror. I'd put it on my phone. I'd put it, in fact, if I, you know, if it was today it, and God said that, I'd be like, hey, can you, can you circle back around? Can you do that again? I didn't have my phone on me. Can you, I need to record that, Right? because I would want to review that every single day. And so my question for myself is why don't I? I have it right here. I've got this statement. And I think it's because so often other voices can become noise. I can consume so many other things. And we can question our identity. We can have things come into our lives that cause us to question but we can anchor to the fact that God, with this statement, looks at us the same way he did with Jesus and he says, this is my son, this is my daughter, I did not make a mistake. And I don't know about you, but every now and again, I, I have that question, am, am I a mistake? And God would want to Make sure we understand we are made in his image. We are made in the image of God and he did not make a mistake. Point number two, this should drive what we consume. This should drive what we consume. Going back to Michael Phelps, his identity drove his consumption, right? In order to be an Olympic athlete, he had to consume 10,000 calories. In fact, if he didn't consume 10,000 calories, what would have happened? His performance would have gone down and it would start to change the fact that he was an Olympic athlete, right? He'd, he wouldn't be able to get there. And so I wanna ask this morning, does our consumption reflect the diet of a son or a daughter of God or is it filled with bloated calories and emptiness and just noise? Because I think sometimes we can pretend. We, we can pretend that we're something we're not. And so we're filling ourselves with things that don't reflect who we actually are. For example, one of, the, one of the phrases used to describe who Jesus is, is that he is the prince of peace. And so if we are people who follow Jesus and are in him, in Jesus, in Christ, we also should be people who are peaceful. We are filled with peace. And so sometimes I feel like I'm surprised when I'm not peaceful, yet all the things that I'm consuming are filled with anxiety. They're filled with fear. They're filled with emotions. And I question, why am I not a peaceful person when everything I'm consuming is the opposite of peace? It has nothing to do with peace. And so if I'm listening to everything but God's voice, why would I be surprised when I don't look more like Jesus? And so this morning I wanna say, instead, let our identity be driven by this phrase, that our identity would drive our consumption. 
And can you imagine the confidence, the sure footing? Can you imagine how peaceful we would be if we began to start with this phrase, if we entered into situations knowing who we are to begin? In fact, we see later in the narrative, we see later in this story that when the tempter comes to Jesus and challenges his identity, he is sure-footed and he is confident because he knows who he is. So when the tempter comes to derail him from his mission, to get him off course, he's confident and he is sure-footed. But first, we have to fill ourselves. We have to consume this. Point number three, this is where change comes from. This is where change comes from. The overflow of this statement is significant because it changes our posture. It changes the way we relate to others and the way we relate to situations. We're no longer striving. We're no longer trying to achieve something. We're not trying to earn anything anymore when we're anchored to this statement. Uh, Two years ago, I think it was, about a year and a half ago or so, I was part of an indoor soccer league and somehow there are about eight teams in this league and somehow the team I was on we made it to the semifinals and so we had a game on a Saturday morning at 8 a.m. so our team shows up at about 7 30 to try and warm up and get ready and and we're doing our drills or whatever we're older people so we didn't like it was basically we just run and try try not to get hurt you know at eight o'clock in the morning so anyways the other team is showing up and they've only got a couple of people on the field and it's getting closer and closer to to eight o'clock and there's not more people from the other team and so finally the referee turns eight o'clock he looks at the other team and he says hey is the rest of your team here and they said no and they didn't have enough people to play and so they forfeited And we automatically moved on to the finals, which was really incredible. Um, But I remember that we still played the game. We decided, you know what, we're still going to use this game as a way to warm up. So we shared some of our players to fill out their team, and we played anyways. And I remember so clearly this game because we played maybe the best game we ever played all season. We passed better. We shot better. We had so much more fun. I remember that game being a blast. And here's why. We already knew we won. Our status was secure. We weren't trying to win. We knew we had already won. And this statement, this identity puts us in a very similar posture that we're not striving to earn something. Our status as sons and daughters of God is secure. It's unchangeable. We are loved. We don't have to try and earn it. God loves us fully and deeply. And he's already pleased with us before we even start to perform or do anything. And so we can enter situations ready to go. And this, is the, this, this phrase, this begins that interchange, that transformation, so we can enter situations, enter relationships with this filling us up. And I think it even changes how we interact with others and what needs we're asking them to meet. I'm a, one of my love languages is words of affirmation. And so it's, encouragement's a really big deal to me. But if I'm looking to people to fill that core need and that core identity of who I am and to speak to that, I'm putting a pressure on them that they can't, they can't meet it. And the truth is, is God has already said something about me. So when I'm anchored to this, I can enter into situations instead of having a cup that's empty and I'm, I'm functioning from a deficit, hoping that people around me will fill that, I can enter into situations full, knowing who I am and instead overflowing who Jesus is to those around me. I can enter into situations with a full cup. And so today, I wanna ask you, can you hear him? Can you hear him say this to you? This is my son. This is my daughter, whom I love. With him, with her, I am well pleased. Or is there a bunch of other noise in your life that's drowning that out? So we're going to do something a little bit different today. I'm going to invite Jake and the team to come back out. And 
I'm going to read some questions that hopefully will help us posture ourselves in a place to receive this. Because what I don't want to do is I don't want to move into the next season of our lives without an opportunity to anchor back to this statement. So if you're comfortable, maybe close your eyes and I'm going to ask you, do you have an appetite for the voice of God? Or are you distracted by the noise? What are you consuming? What are you putting into your life that would speak to your identity, to who you are? Is God's voice the loudest in your life? Is it even audible? And if it's not, can you turn down all the other noise? And now here's something I want to do together. If you're comfortable, you can, you can open your eyes again if you want to. So I'd like to take just a, f- a couple moments and I want to reflect on this, this statement. And so if you take notes with pen and paper, if you're joining us online, you can get one or pull out your phone. In fact, this is going to be one of the few times that in church I'm going to ask you to pull out your phone and open up something to take a note. And here's what I want to do. I want you to take this phrase and I want you to insert your name in it. And I want you to type out, this is how it would read for me. This is Jordan, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. And I just wanna sit for a couple minutes with that phrase and just reflect on it. Because maybe, maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time and you haven't heard this in a while. And maybe for the first time, you might be thinking, I can be a son or a daughter of God. I didn't even think it was possible. And so I wanna take another moment and just allow us to sit and rest in that truth and anchor ourselves back to this phrase.